All right, and I know everybody's, nobody ever wants to ask the first question, but there is a prize. Who would like to ask the first question? There's one over there, all right. Hello. Um, simple question on surface, probably not so easy to answer. How does the future look like IBM now? The IBM. <laughs> the one thing we probably can't answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. That we can't talk about IBM or anything like that. So um, nope, he does. He doesn't get the prize. We need a better question than that. Who's got the first question here? <laughs> All right, way up front. I know it's late. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. Oops, turn. There, there you go. Yes, sir. Uh, hi guys, um, we really love the uh, OKD which we installed at our company and we're looking forward to uh, OpenShift 4 and so we wanted to ask are all those um, operator and auto updating features uh, also going to be available for the OKD uh, project for us who can't quite yet do that uh, with the subscriptions? So I'm going to take this one. Um, so the basic product functionality will be there, you're right. But as you know, we actually run for our partners a certification program for their certified operators and certified workloads on OpenShift. So th one of the results of that is that you can actually call Red Hat and get support, like L1 support, deal with your problems with the operator, right? You can't do that with OKD, obviously, and you won't even see those operators there. But all the community operators are there. And uh, the functionality is the same. So you'll get the updates. You can trigger the update of the platform itself from the UI. That's all going to be there. Um, but um, it's not supported, right? All right. Who's got the next question? Way in the back. Taro's got them. So uh, hi, my name is Tufan. I'm from Agrico. Uh, I have, uh, in my company, we have been facing a unique challenge uh, with respect to OpenShift. So we, uh, in our company, are developing uh, uh, battery systems, which are standalone cubes, where we have just one uh, big industrial PC, and we try to implement a standalone OpenShift cluster over there. We can't call it a cluster. It's a standalone. Uh, but the real idea of implementing OpenShift was that uh, later on, we will have customers will have multiple such cubes in their uh, uh, power plants or wherever they put that. But <clears throat> there are customers who start with one cube and they just want the standalone setup there. So challenges we have been facing was like the storage for our databases when we use uh, standalone becomes very tricky because ClusterFS by default you required three nodes or we want to want to uh, have this flexibility with the uh, storage. So what are your suggestions for storage in such cases where we have to take care of multi-node scenario and a single node scenario as well? Uh, just, just to make sure we got the question correct, um, it, you're talking about running uh, OpenShift on a single node, it's like all in one, is that? OK. Yeah. And then your, how does storage work in that environment, basically? What platform are you on? Um, is, this, is this a cloud, like single VM or bare metal? or? Uh, it's a single VM. It's a single bare metal server. So we have this industrial PC. And we install with an all-in-one server. And later point of time, if there is a demand, we scale it into a cluster where all the nodes are all-in-one server. Gotcha. And so you, you want to move from a single to a multi-node later on, basically? Yeah. Um, so the great thing about OpenShift 4 is we're using all the kube primitives to run the cluster itself, including um, things like taints and tolerations and node selectors for actually you know, scheduling out the, the master components to the masters and, and that type of thing. And so what this lends you to do is in day two operations is change around that environment all the time. So if you wanted to add 
dedicated node pools for doing uh, ingress or monitoring or um, whatever, including scaling up your control plane, you can do that via those systems. Um, so going from a single node to multi-node is supported. Um, I will throw out a caveat that we basically only support HA uh, control plane by default. Um, we don't really want you running a single node because there are use cases for it, but it's not uh, very common, basically. But you have a lot of flexibility going from single to multi uh, with OpenShift 4. Yeah, so in terms of the control panel, it has been absolutely smooth. But when we talk about the storage part, it becomes tricky. Like the, the cluster FS, which is like a default for right, right now for OpenShift, it becomes tricky when you have less than three nodes because it's, generally it's not supported. And if you modify the replica, replicas and you try to uh, make it work, but when you scale up with storage that like this redistribution and uh, rebalancing is quite tricky and brings down the servers. As so yeah. any suggestions for the storage part when we have a single node? Um, so some of the storage operators that um, we saw, talked about at the panel, for example, like the uh, Rook should be able to handle the nodes. I don't know if they, they handle single node use cases either, but it's basically looking at like uh, node labels and things like that to know what it can divvy up storage for. Um, and then one of the other things we do is just also depend on the platform that you're running on. So um, integrating you know, with uh, EBS volumes on Amazon, et cetera, um, whatever we have. But sometimes that's either just nothing, local disk, or NFS, or whatever you have as well. So our but, use case is mostly limited to the very remote part of the world. <laughs> like sometimes we have to uh, put a, a container. It's like a container, though, as a whole, the cube is a container. So we have to put a container somewhere in African countries where you have very less chances of getting a internet connectivity, or it's very slow. The things are coming up, but it's the backbone there. So we have to be offline all the time, mostly, and plan accordingly. So we have to, so the operators are very interesting because it can offload some of the work that we can connect. We don't need to connect and work on that. So really exciting to look into this. Thanks. Yeah, let's chat afterwards about this because I think uh, I want to understand your use case a little bit more. Okay, thank Thanks. you. And you can create the ticket when you use OpenShift yeah. and use the support. So, Taro, behind you, there's one. I have a quick question on OpenShift 4.0. What's your plan for um, migrating or upgrading customers on 3.x? And I'm specifically interested in on prem environments like running bare metal or KVM or vSphere? Well, a uh, couple of things. One is, um, you know, um, we are working on a migration tool which will let you uh, migrate uh, applications. Uh, this is an application migration tool. Uh, we did a demo at, uh, of this tool at Red Hat Summit, and I think the video should be on YouTube, so you can kind of take a look at that. But that's the idea is to be able to migrate uh, applications from a three cluster to a four cluster. Um, you know, and there are some details behind it. But I really liked uh, what we saw with McGuire Bank uh, earlier today. Uh, I mean, you know, to me that, that was a great uh, way in which they handle updates without even requiring a tool like that because they're already al always constantly updating uh, or create a new fresh cluster every 90 days. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I mean, that's another option, uh, but we are working on an application migration too. The one thing to add to that is the rationale behind that and our, our thinking is um, doing in-place upgrades from three to four is extremely risky because at some point there you're going to pivot a lot of the services over and you might, if you run into an issue, you have no good cluster um, on three or four. And so the thinking was to make a general purpose migration tool, which is useful to go from three to four, but also four to four clusters or whatever, and also let you do that on a per namespace basis. So um, you know, if you have application teams that are ready to move soon versus later, um, you can handle all those use cases. So um, just a quick follow up on that. So does it mean that you expect uh, app Downtime, or uh, you you expect because when I when you talk about migration, um, you, you are looking at potentially uh, having a small downtime if you, especially if you are creating a new cluster and so on. Just wondering what you are thinking of this. Yeah, I th I think it, a lot of it depends on the application, uh, and if the application, for example, can tolerate, uh, for for example, the the fact that there are 
there is data duplication. Um, you can copy, like the migration tool, one of the things that it does is that it can copy uh, your uh, um, data over from this PV to the another PV on the new cluster, but it all depends on if the application can tolerate that kind of stuff. I mean, if it doesn't, then you can, uh, and then you can actually, you'll have to move the uh, uh, volume, if you will, the PV, and at that time, you'd have to quote unquote quest the application, so you will lose some of uh, the uh, downtime in that period. Now, how much it is and uh, what, uh, what it is will depend very much on the application. You know, and so details uh, can be worked out. Yeah. All right, Steve. Thanks, Simon. All right, so uh, yeah, I got a question that in regards to Did the volume come off. All right, there, there we go. Uh, so I got a question in regards to DevOps pat uh, no, I mean GitOps patterns in relation to relation to ah, relation to OpenShift. Do you see any future for uh, GitOps patterns in regards to operators, deployment of operators, and uh, Knative as well? Did you get that? Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, the, sorry. The, about yeah. working with GitOps and OpenShift yeah. in general. Um, I'll share uh, one thing that we do internally is uh, we have a product called OpenShift Dedicated that you know we're hosting OpenShift for customers, and we have a, a little bit more of a lockdown environment for you to kind of you know generally support that environment, and we have an operator that does that. So it basically writes out a bunch of our back rules, turns you know this on or off or whatever. Um, so an operator is a way to get like a standard environment. So you boot up a cluster, throw this operator on it, it transforms it into a XYZ internal company cluster possibly. Um, and so that's one way of, on the cluster level. And then uh, I think there's plenty of uh, solutions just, you know, I think in general in the Kubernetes community about taking manifests from GitHub and applying them. Um, so if, if it's like a blind apply, then that works. If you need to script it around, you know, people use Jenkins and all kinds of other stuff for that. Um, I don't think we're extremely opinionated on that other than it's generally a good practice. I don't know if anyone else has comments. I think you, you asked for the relationship to operators, so you definitely want to be able to apply the same pattern to the artifacts that are managed by the operator, right? So instead of having your base Kubernetes manifest, like your deployments, your config maps, secrets, PVCs, all stored in GitHub, and basically get it applied by a GitHub or a GitOps process, you want to use an operator, uh, which then only exposes a single API and that remains a single file in your GitHub repository, uh, which you can continuously apply and update from, right? You want to basically move away of managing all these um, Kubernetes primitive artifacts to make up your application stack, and you want to have a piece of software that runs on the cluster that understands the application, and you basically just apply GitOps to its configuration. So you would basically just put the custom resource in, the, in GitOps and let the operator on cluster worry about the rest. Question. Hi. Uh, to follow up about uh, what you mentioned about the migration uh, application, so Ansys has a ab migration uh, into JKE of VMs and other pod is, Does the migration also do uh, something along those lines? The migration, which you mentioned before. Uh, was, was it on the VM study? I mean, there is an echo in the room, and I Sorry. can't hear uh, I'll repeat. Um, uh, Project uh, Ansys says uh, that they can uh, migrate VMs from AWS, for example, into JKE and also other oh. uh, clusters. So does our migration for OpenShift do something similar? So let me see if I can, I got your question right. So are you saying, can you migrate a application or set of applications uh, from OpenShift running on one cloud to another cloud using that tool? Uh, not necessarily. But the VMs. VMs, oh, the VMs, okay. Uh, no, this is actually the application migration, so this is not at the, VM level, if you know. So we are also looking at how to migrate the control plane itself, if that was your question, but you know, we are not moving the VM itself, right? Like we are just moving the application, the, the parts and the PVs. I was like, list out everything that the migration tool migrates. Oh, yeah, right. So I mean, I think so, at, at, a, at a basic level, it is really migrating all the Kubernetes objects in that namespace and 
all the PVs that are in that namespace. So, I mean, so that includes the Kubernetes object. So, uh, that's how that application migration works. Way over there. Yep, works. Hi. Um, our customers mostly use OKD on premise in their data center, and they're a bit of afraid for OKD4, for what operating system can we use for installation? Also just Atomic or CentOS or RHEL or what would be the possibilities? Um, well, I mean, um, OKD, uh, what, I, I think it's going to be on RHEL Chorus. I don't know if anybody knows this answer. I don't. Uh, I think in the short term, it's um, going to be CentOS based and then um, eventually uh, Fedora Core OS based. But I believe right now the Fedora Core OS bits are, exist but are not shipping yet in OKD, if that makes sense. There we go. And there we go. Hi, guys. Um, just a question on uh, potential GA for Federation uh, in OpenShift 4. Is that something on the roadmap? Um, it's it's something we're looking at. Um, it was going to be in the 4.1 release, but um, we had to shove that out for for various reasons around resourcing. Um, I think it will still probably just be tech preview in the 4.2 release as current planning, though we're doing our best to pull it in as quickly as much as possible. I'd love to chat to you about your use case after the session, though, if that's okay. And there's an operator and operator hub for it, so you can try it out in its tech preview. All right. Any more questions? Way down there. Okay, I'll make Tarot run. Hi. Um, are there plans of supporting IPI for uh, vSphere? Five minutes. They're all <laughs> there are plans. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe it's beyond 4.2. Uh, maybe it's 4.3 or 4.4. So, yeah, there are plans for sure. Yeah, the guiding principle there is we want to um, have full service provisioning for any platform that we can. So if there are APIs we can hit, so all the cloud providers, um, OpenStack, um, certain flavors of um, different vSphere installs you can. And so we want to do that for everything that we can. All right, there we go. Yes, OK, thanks. Um, you said that uh, OCP 4.2 uh, allows disconnected installations. Uh, what are the requirements for then 4.1? Uh, what is a connected uh, installation? Does it require full internet access or just access uh, from certain Red Hat servers to the installation? Because we are running on premise, so locked down. Yeah, I can take this at, at least at a high level. I don't know if anyone has any more technical details. Um, so uh, the Two things that we don't um, have for 4.1 are um, fully disconnected as well as understanding uh, proxy um, ingress and egress. And it, it's one of those things where we, it's been architected into it, it's not supported in 4.1. Um, and so a connected cluster is pulling container images from uh, Quay.io as well as um, Red Hat registries, um, connecting with our update service um, hosted by Red Hat. Um, and I think. That's basically it. It's designed to be container image uh, based so that a disconnected environment is just pulling from your registry instead of our registry. Um, and then you would, instead of connecting to like a Red Hat update service, you would tell it, this is the exact thing that I want to upgrade to. Stay tuned. Hi, Mark from Six again. Um, I have a question about um, Tectone. And I think Daniel talked about it, that it would be included in OpenShift 4. Can I also use it in 3.x, Tecton pipelines? We are targeting 4. It's only 4. 4. We are targeting 4. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. It's the end of Jenkins. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Going, going, gone. 
will, um, in the interest of time, because I think they kick us out of the room at five on the dot, um, I'm going to let Brian come up and close us out with uh, the road ahead and thank the wonderful group of Red Hat product managers and tech folks here. And um, this is where you get the facial imprinting and recognition of those people. So for the next week, they'll be haunting the halls and giving presentations so you can track them down and corner them and ask the questions you wouldn't ask in public today. So um, please do find us. We'll be in the booth. We'll be doing lots of things like that. So um, we're here to answer your questions. So thanks. And with that, thank you guys. Great work.